Welcome back to Bad Things in History, that friend who tells you uncomfortable truths you wish you didn't need to hear. Our series examining the worst and least known events of the 1970s continues. In this episode, we look at some of the worst parts of 1978. Controversial court decisions, grave robbing, and construction disasters were just a few of the random and terrible events from this deadly year. Let's start with two men who decided to steal Charlie Chaplin's corpse. Kidnapping Charlie Chaplin Charlie Chaplin was born in London, England on April 16, 1889. His childhood was filled with poverty and deprivation, but as Charlie approached his mid-twenties in 1914, he began appearing in motion pictures. For almost 30 years, he enjoyed the life of a famous actor. However, Charlie Chaplin also had a fondness for young women. In 1941, he began having an affair with the American actress Joan Barry, who was 21 at the time. She became pregnant three times during the affair. The first two pregnancies were terminated, but the third pregnancy produced a baby girl. As Joan was having Charlie Chaplin's child, he was having another affair with an 18-year-old actress named Una O'Neill, Charlie married Una in 1943 when he was 54 years old. Meanwhile, Joan Barry filed a paternity suit against Charlie and won. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, had long suspected that Charlie might be a communist, so he used recent events to generate bad press. Charlie and Una returned to England in September 1952. Charlie Chaplin then discovered that he was permanently banned from entering the United States. He eventually moved to Switzerland and remained there for the rest of his life. Charlie died on December 25, 1977, at the age of 88 years old. Just a few months later, his body would be stolen. Roman Wardus was from Poland. Gancho Ganev was from Bulgaria. They were both automobile mechanics, but instead of working on cars, the pair decided that stealing Charlie Chaplin's body and holding it for ransom would be a better way to earn a living. Una refused to pay the thieves. Meanwhile, police continued to investigate. After five weeks, they found the corpse thieves and arrested them. Charlie's body was found buried in a nearby field. He was relocated to a new grave, which was reinforced with concrete to discourage any future grave robbers. The thieves were sentenced to four years in prison. Willow Island Disaster in addition to grave robbery, 1978 had one of the deadliest construction accidents in history. During the 1970s, the United States experienced an increased demand for electricity. Production in the eastern part of the country was met by building numerous coal-powered power plants along the Ohio River. In April 1978, construction began on a new facility. It was located on Willow Island in West Virginia. An important part of the power plant was cooling towers. These were tall structures made of concrete, which helped move excess heat out of the power plant. A contractor from New Jersey was hired to build the towers on Willow Island. Before building the towers, the contractors first had to build scaffolding. This allowed workers to access them while construction was still in progress. By April 27th, the contractors had finished one of the towers and were working on the second one. It was almost finished standing at 166 feet tall, unfortunately the tower would never be completed. As a giant bucket of concrete was being lifted to the top of the tower, the crane which was lifting it suddenly fell forward. When the crane and the bucket began falling, all the concrete started to collapse. In turn, it collapsed all the scaffolding. Volunteers from nearby communities rushed to help rescue the victims. It soon became apparent that all 51 construction workers were dead. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration investigated the contracting company responsible for the disaster. It concluded that they were guilty of at least 20 safety violations. In the end, the company had to pay $1,700 per worker killed. No criminal charges were ever filed. Los Alfaques Disaster Living in a petroleum-based economy comes with certain risks. In 1978, innocent people in Spain paid the price for modern convenience. On July 11th, it was a warm summer in Spain. The Los Alfaques campsite was a popular destination for tourists and it was packed with visitors. 
Nearly 1,000 people inhabited the campsite. Their tents were scattered throughout the area. Northeast of the campsite was a popular nightclub. Locals and tourists loved it to go there for drinking and dancing. About 63 miles away from the campsite and the nightclub was a refinery. Around 10.15 that morning, a truck left the refinery with a container full of propylene. Propylene is a petroleum chemical used for manufacturing other chemicals. It is also very flammable, and the truck was carrying 23 tons of it. Around 2.35 p.m., the truck was passing near the campsite. A tire had a blowout and the vehicle lost control. It crashed into a wall, and propylene began streaming from a rupture in the tank. A white cloud began spreading from the truck and into the campsite. People approached the cloud out of curiosity. Soon, they were unable to see anything as the mist became so thick it made the air opaque. The cloud began drifting until it reached the nearby nightclub. At that point, a spark ignited the giant mist of propylene and it exploded. Everything within 300 feet of the blast was destroyed. The buildings and people who were unlucky enough to be another 600 feet beyond the blast radius were badly burned. Bystanders began trying to save the victims. Most of them were taken to nearby hospitals, but the survivors also had burns to over 90% of their bodies. In the end, the explosion claimed the lives of at least 157 people. More than 300 were severely injured. An inquiry discovered that the truck had been overloaded and was missing several safety features. Additionally, the government banned vehicles that carried dangerous cargo from traveling through heavily populated areas. The Umbrella Attack Communist governments in the 1970s didn't take criticism lightly. Georgi Markov was born in Bulgaria on March 1, 1929. He graduated from high school in 1946 and entered a university to continue his studies. He focused on industrial chemistry and even worked as a chemical engineer for a short time. In 1948, Georgi became ill with tuberculosis. He was forced to spend time recovering in the hospital on several occasions. During these long-term stays in the hospital, he began writing. He published his first novel in 1957. By 1966, he had produced a collection of stories that cemented his place among the most important writers in Bulgarian history. In 1969, Georgi went to Bologna, Italy. In 1971, he decided to not return to Bulgaria and instead moved to London. To earn a living in his new home, he began working for the BBC. More specifically, Georgi worked on stories that criticized the communist government of Bulgaria. On September 7, 1978, he walked across the Waterloo Bridge, which crosses the Thames River. After crossing, he waited for a bus. Suddenly, Georgi felt a sharp pain in the back of his thigh. It felt like a bug bite or a sting. As he turned, he saw a man pick up an umbrella and run away. After arriving at work, Georgi noticed that the place where he felt the sting was getting more painful. Later that night, he developed a fever and went to the hospital. On September 11, 1978, just four days after arriving at the emergency room, Georgie was dead. An autopsy found a tiny pellet near the wound in his thigh. The pellet contained ricin, a deadly poison for which there was no cure. They believed that a device on the umbrella that Georgie saw was used to insert the pellet into his skin. Additional investigations also concluded that the Bulgarian intelligence services, in combination with the Soviet KGB, worked together to assassinate Georgi Markov. Nobody was ever arrested or punished for the murder. The Bridgewater Four England was at the center of mindless violence more than once during the 1970s. On September 19, 1978, Carl Bridgewater was 13 years old. He was delivering newspapers that morning. He attempted to leave a copy of the morning paper at Yew Tree Farm, which was near the town of Starbridge. Before Carl could complete his task, somebody shot him in the head. The police investigated and determined that the residence was probably being robbed at the time Carl showed up. The burglars forced the young child into the house and killed him. Unfortunately, the police had no idea who did it. On November 24th, authorities believed that they had found the murderers. Patrick Malloy, James Robinson, as well as Michael and Vincent Hickey were identified as the gunmen in an armed robbery near Birmingham. Six days later, they robbed an elderly couple at gunpoint. 
Patrick Malloy was the first to be arrested. After being interrogated for hours, he told police that the four men were robbing the house that day. One of them must have killed Carl Bridgewater. James, Michael, and Vincent were given life in prison. Patrick Malloy was given a sentence of 12 years, but he died in prison from a heart attack in 1981. An appeal filed on February 27, 1997 overturned their convictions. It was determined that the police fabricated much of the evidence used to convict the man. Star Canopus Diving Accident The North Sea is full of platforms that extract oil from beneath the ocean floor. The commercial divers that work on them perform the most dangerous job in the world, and many of them have paid the ultimate price. To service the oil platforms, divers need to go down to the ocean floor. In some cases, they can go as deep as 500 feet. Because of the extreme pressures at this depth, the divers can't just jump in the water and swim down. Instead, they use a diving bell. A diving bell is a chamber used to transport divers to the bottom of the ocean and bring them back up again. It is connected to a ship by a set of wires and hoses. The ship provides power as well as hot water to heat the bell. On November 27, 1978, a diving support vessel called the Star Canopus was positioned near the barrel Alpha oil platform in the North Sea. Located 334 feet below the ship was a diving bell. Two divers, Michael Ward and Tony Prangley, emerged from the bell and began working on repairs to the platform. Around 3 a.m., a squall hit the Star Canopus and began blowing it out of position. The captain ordered Michael and Tony to stop what they were doing and get back in the diving bell. He wanted to bring the man back to the surface as soon as possible. Michael was able to safely return to the diving bell, but Tony was having a problem. He couldn't get one of the umbilical hoses that supplied oxygen back into the diving bell, which in turn prevented him from closing the hatch. Finally, Tony cut the hose, closed the hatch, and told the ship that they were ready. The star canopus began lifting the divers. As the diving bell was being raised, the star canopus was blown across the anchor chain of another ship. When the diving bell was 98 feet from the surface, the cables and hoses connecting it to the support vessel were suddenly cut. The bell plunged nearly 300 feet back to the bottom of the ocean. Michael and Tony survived the fall, but the hatch which would allow them to leave the diving bell was stuck in the mud, so they couldn't exit and do anything to help themselves. Also, the hot water hose was no longer working, so the temperature in the diving bell began to drop quickly. Because of the storm on the surface, it took 13 hours for rescuers to finally retrieve the bell. Both its occupants were dead. Michael Ward lost his life to hypothermia. Tony Prangley drowned before he was able to freeze to death. Was 1978 a truly horrible year of random violence, suffering, and death? And do you think things are better today? Tell us what you think in the comments below. If you found this episode interesting, then please watch another and subscribe to our channel so you are always well informed about the worst parts of humanity's past. Would you like to make sure that we keep making episodes every week? Then do your part. It isn't that hard either, just share an episode with someone. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.